Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and welcome to another Ask an Open Shift Admin here on Red Hat Live Streaming. I am Chris Short, host with the most of Red Hat Live Streaming, and I'm joined by my friend and colleague, Andrew Sullivan. Andrew, how are you doing today, sir? I am well. How are you? I saw, uh, I, I was looking at the weather this morning. It looks hot up there in Michigan, um, so welcome back to North Carolina. It is extremely very Florida out right now, and uh, the heat advisories are in effect for like the third time this summer. So this yeah. is this is very different for us. Yeah. Um, well, they they said this morning that we had the the hottest July ever record, recorded, yeah. mm -hmm. um, and it appears that August is is certainly on the same track. So yeah. I know that has a lot of implications for a lot of people. You know, there's been a number of storms. Uh, yeah. uh, speaking which, to our peers in you know Boston, New England area, I hope you're all safe after. Mm -hmm. uh, the tropical storm went through there. I know there's a bunch of fires happening on the West Coast and other places as well, even further. That smoke is making it here, by the way. Yeah, so pretty wild. Yeah, I, I you know, I'm I'm U.S. based, so we hear mostly about the U.S. But worldwide, I I hope everybody's staying safe out there because uh, things are crazy. Yeah, I have been trying to get a family out of Afghanistan for over a week now, and it doesn't look good. So I will just yeah. leave it at that. Uh, but enough about world events yeah. and such we're going to talk some compliance and security today uh, we are so uh so awesome. yes <clears throat> excuse me uh so first hello everyone welcome to the ask an open shift admin hour uh so this live stream is one of our office hours series of streams uh, what that means is that we are here uh, much like if you were in in school at any point and you had a teacher or a professor who had office hours we're here for you right we want to answer questions uh, we want to interact with you all, whatever it is that is happening in your worlds, feel free to reach out and, and ask us or let us know. And we'll do our best to address those questions uh, here on the stream. If we can't for whatever reason, we will follow up and answer those. Uh, so every week following this stream, uh, usually on Friday, but sometimes uh, a little later, uh, we have a blog post that recaps everything that we talked about here. So if you happen to miss something, if we can't answer a question, uh, at, at worst, we'll put it in the blog post or maybe even follow up in the next stream. Uh, so with all of that being said, don't hesitate to ask your questions across whatever platform you're watching on. Uh, the, the Magic Restream software consolidates all the chats into one, so uh, we can see all of those that are going on. Yeah, and you can conversate with people on other networks. Yeah. Here as well. So feel free to say hello and chat and ask any questions you may have. Absolutely, including on Discord. Um, yes. So I know you've got a, a link for that somewhere. Uh, so as Chris mentioned, today's uh, topic, the topic of the stream, uh, which again, don't let that uh, don't let that limit you or limit your questions to just this topic. But uh, right. today's topic is compliance and security. And Andrew is, uh, I like to think I'm aware of security, but it's a big topic. And, uh, you know, even you and I put together and multiplied times 10 would be just barely scratching the surface. So yeah. Uh, we were are, are very fortunate to have three subject matter experts with us. Uh, so welcoming back Mark Russell, who was here for our uh, Red Hat Enterprise Linux CoreOS episode. Uh, so Mark is a product manager um, in the OpenShift business unit, or I guess now we're the hybrid platforms business unit. Yes. Uh, and uh, so two, two first time folks on the stream. So we have Doran Caspin, uh, who is also a product manager and Juan, but we call him Oz. And Juan, I actually don't know where you sit in the organization. I don't know either. So that's two of us. <laughs> <laughs> you're uh, you're on the engineering side, right? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Cool. So lot, lots of uh, expertise, lots of brain power to help answer uh, answer questions about whatever it happens to come up. And we've got a huge list of topics that we want to get through today. Um, so. I'm going to waste no time and go ahead and get into this week's uh, top of mind topic list. Uh, so I have, uh, let's see, how many are there? Four this week. Mm -hmm. um, so we'll go ahead and churn through those real quick. I'll drop them uh, as you go. First thing I'm going to do is find, you know, I really need to, I wish, I know I say this like every week, I wish Zoom would make these little windows bigger so I could tell which one is which easier. Oh, Instead yeah, of trying to the guess. sharing bits? Yeah. yeah, totally. Yeah. Uh, so the first one that I want to talk about is the time to update cluster operators has been reduced. 
Um, so did you grab the link for that? I got it. Yep. Okay. Uh, so I am on the release notes here. So if we scroll all the way up here, this is simply the uh, OCP 4.8 release notes. And way up here near the top, um, I'm going to have to hit enter again so that way it's easier for me to find. Um, you know, I say that and now it's aha, improved upgrade duration. Uh, so way up here at the top, basically engineering did some testing, some validation and made some changes so that as you can see here, the time to upgrade a cluster and specifically the cluster operators has been dramatically reduced. Uh, so the magic behind the scenes here is actually pretty straightforward. Um, so I'll, I'm going to pick on this one, which is uh, the Maltus Steam Inset. Uh, effectively, what the change was is to change the max unavailable to being a percentage. Uh, pretty much across the board, they're set to 10% or something along those lines. Uh, and the change here is that, of course, more hosts are able to update at the same time, which means that as you scale up the number of hosts in the cluster, that's time to do the update or apply the update is relatively flat. Uh, do keep in mind though, that this is only the cluster operators. Uh, so if there is something that, for example, triggers a reboot or something like that, it means that you would still be at the mercy of a pod disruption budget or you know, maybe some other operator there that, uh, or some other deployment that is preventing that update from applying to more, more than one host or more than the available hosts here. But important thing is, at least in many configurations, uh, maybe even most configurations, updates are going to happen a lot faster, which is mm. definitely good news. So, and did you grab that uh, the example link that I had there? I don't know if yeah. I actually posted that one into our shared that document. one in there. No, yeah, so I'll post that in the chat. Thank you. Uh, so that was the first one. Relatively straightforward, just to be aware that if all of a sudden you were you know, expecting to click the update button and then go and get lunch and come back and maybe then get a cup of coffee, uh, now might maybe just get that cup of coffee. Uh, yeah. Or maybe just lunch instead of both. Anyways, uh, so the next one that I wanted to talk about is a question that I've had asked. Uh, it's come up twice in the last week, but it's kind of come up periodically uh, over the last year or so. Hmm. Uh, and that is... Can we use the integrated load balancer that's deployed with on-prem IPI with other deployment mechanisms? Like, can I use that with UPI? Can I use that with non-integrated? So on and so forth. Hmm. So officially, no. Uh, so essentially, it is not a tested supported configuration in order to do that, but it is technically possible. Uh, so I'm going to come back to OpenShift here and GitHub. Come on. And if I search for machine config and we look at the machine config operator and we go to templates and I think it's in common, on-prem, aisles. Uh, so what we see inside of here, no, oh, anyway, somewhere inside of here is uh, basically the configuration that's used for that. And it's triggered at deployment time simply by having those virtual IP addresses defined. So if you, in your install config.yaml, if you just define those IP addresses, it'll automatically deploy and configure uh, keep alive D, et cetera. So yes, it's possible technically, but just remember it is definitely not tested and supported in that respect. So maybe good for a, uh, uh, lab or a test environment, something like that. Hey, Andrew, uh, do you mind if I go back and actually bring up something else that you were right near on the uh, 4.8 release notes? I think is uh, um, an interesting thing to mention. It's right beneath that. And so what that means where it says MC awaits for all machine config pools to update before reporting the upgrade update is complete. So this um, this affects, this means uh, previously we were, we were reporting that the update was complete when the control plane was complete. And so you could still have worker pools that had not finished updating. Um, meanwhile, some people and uh, in, in some customers may have accidentally, you know, may have thought that the, uh, that the update was complete, even though some worker pools or, you know, their one worker pool wasn't complete and they would then move to another version of OpenShift, you know, 4.6 to 4.7, 4.7 to 4.8. And now you have, now you have a bigger problem. So hmm. this way it will not show you the upgrade button until all pools are, are completed. 
Um, and just the only other thing I want to mention about that is that this is what we call, it blocks what we call Y stream upgrades. So it will block you from going from 4.7 to 4.8 until everything is complete. Um, but it won't block you from a, a, a Z release, from a, from a patch release, um, if you need to get that out and patch the control plane. So anyway, I just thought um, that was worth sharing. Yeah, thank you. I I remember hearing about that, but I did not know it had actually gone into the uh, uh, release notes or anything. So uh, it's a pretty you. logical assumption, you know. It says it's done. Uh, you, you think it's done, but yeah, uh, you know, we've, <laughs> it turns out we really need to bring people's attention to the fact that not all the machine, you know, not all the worker pools may may be complete. So yeah. Um. Okay. Well, thank you. Now, let's see. I'm going to I'm going to tackle probably the most complex one next, <laughs> which is um, so there has been coming up over the last few days a large number of folks internally who have brought up that either they personally are seeing or their customers are seeing this particular issue, uh, and it's not just on 4.6. It seems to be happening across multiple other cluster versions as well. Uh, so essentially what we're seeing or what they're seeing is a, an issue or a, a problem being raised inside of the console saying that the system memory exceeds reserved, um, basically saying that, you know, hey, something on the host, Kublet, et cetera, is using more memory or more CPU than what has been allocated to it. So if you peruse through this uh, BZ, there's a, a large number of comments in here. Uh, well, I say a large number, it only goes down through six here. Um, but anyways, it's being addressed. We're aware of it um, and all of that. Now, the reason why I'm bringing this up again is because, um, so one, in the uh, Kubernetes Slack, uh, somebody had asked about this. And what they had specifically asked about was, what does the auto sizing reserved do? So a couple of weeks ago, we had talked about this on the stream. Right, where you know, hey, you can dynamically or have the system automatically dynamically allocate resources to the system reserved value, right? So kind of exactly what this BZ is addressing. Now it's disabled by default. And in the documentation here, what we're saying is, hey, go in and create a machine config that sets auto sizing reserved to true. So I dug into this to find out what does that actually mean? What actually happens when we set this value to true? And what are the values that it happens to use? So I'll answer that in reverse order here. So the first one is, what are the values that it actually uses? Uh, and it turns out that we inherit these or, or we use a calculation that comes from Google. Um, so you can see this here is the same methodology that we apply. And we know that that is the same methodology because we have in the code here. Uh, so this is, I'm in machine config operator again, common files, base files, kublet auto sizing dot YAML. So we have this function dynamic memory sizing where it goes through and it takes, right? 20% of, or I'm sorry here, it starts at 25% of the first four gigabytes and then 20% of the next four gigabytes up to eight gigs. 10% of the next blah, blah, blah. So kind of following exactly what is laid out here in Google's own documentation. So the end result is what happens is if I enable this, if I set this auto sizing reserve to true in a machine config, that will then trigger a unit, we can see here, to execute this dynamic system reserved calculation, which will spit out a set of values that are then added to Kublet's own sizing. So if you were to go, just like we showed the last time, if you were to, do I have it up over here somewhere? Let's see if this thing will work real quick. Uh, so if I do OC get node, I do an OC debug. So let's see what happens if I can connect into one of these. Gotta wait for the pod to be pulled. How good is Azure's internet access? There we go. So if I do a ps-ef and grep on kublet, I can see kind of kublet's whole configuration here, including this where it stores its configuration here. 
So more or less where I'm going with all of this is I set this in the machine config as soon as I find the right one here. It triggers this script to be run when the node is booted, which then goes over and it sets inside of the host in the Kublet config, those system reserved values for CPU and memory. So more or less the larger the node, then the more resources will be reserved. And if I can dig around over here briefly, I've got somewhere. Um, I'm digging around on the back uh, on, on my other screen here to see if I can find, aha, yes. Um, there, that's probably the easiest way for me to show these values. Uh, so if you were to math out all of those values, essentially this is what you would get. So for example, with memory, if my node has eight gigabytes of memory assigned to it, if I turn on that auto reservation setting, it will reserve 1.8 gigabytes. If I have 64 gigabytes of memory on my node, then that auto reservation would have roughly five and a half gigabytes reserved for system level things. Um, so uh, this, I copied and pasted this when I was just looking a moment ago from the Kubernetes Slack. Um, I will link that thread as soon as I can find it here into the stream chat. So that way anybody else who wants to look at it, you are more than welcome to look at it. But that's the, uh, that's the kind of quick and quick and dirty version of what's going on there. So if you're curious, if you're seeing that particular bug, please make sure that support is aware about it. Um, so that way we can associate any customer information and that way they can prioritize it appropriately to get everything fixed. Um, short term, you can also turn on that auto sizing. Just be aware that it will consume some additional amount of memory and CPU for those system level resources. Uh, so, and just FYI, we talked about this before, the default, so if you don't have anything set, is one gigabyte of memory and I think 100 milli CPUs, uh, point, point 0.1 cores. Uh, so as you saw, right, if I enable that auto tuning, it's gonna by default bump that up with an eight gigabyte system to 1.8 gigabytes. Uh, so you would lose some usable capacity there. Okay. And the last thing that I've got here, oh, this is a quick and easy one. So the last one that I've got, uh, just real quick, some folks have asked, hey, how do I know what will, you know, if I change something in machine config, what will trigger a node to reboot? Uh, we can actually see that in the code. Uh, so if we look here, we have this function in the machine, again, machine config operator, um, and we have this calculate post config change action, as well as the one above it, below it, above it. Aha. I have the wrong link. I'll have to fix this link before we share it. Right. Um, Already yeah. shared it. <laughs> That's okay. It's actually, it's actually line 424. Uh, so essentially, what, if you read through this, files post, can change, post config change action equals none. So it basically says, hey, if I'm changing the kubitca.crt or config.json, don't do anything, right? They get updated, right? And the system automatically knows that, that something changed, right? If I change Etsy containers registries.conf, then I need to reload cryo or creo, however you pronounce it. Um, you know, so on and so forth. So you can kind of walk through it's it's not, you know, documentation, you know, as friendly as documentation, but you can kind of walk through the code here and you can see, hey, what is going to when I change something, what is going to be the resulting action in the cluster. So maybe beneficial to you uh, if you're curious about that. I'm looking into uh, yeah there I think some of this is documented, but I have seen some confusion out there because people sometimes expect a machine config to cause a reboot. And then when they choose one of these actions, they can be actually surprised that it doesn't reboot. I mean, it's like, maybe it's a pleasant surprise, but yeah. nonetheless, <laughs> not what they were expecting. Um, you know, it used to be before 4.6, it was a much simpler mental model. Um, you change something yeah. and it, it reboots rebooted. Yeah. and it, it rolls the cluster. Um, the one that isn't, uh, doesn't seem to be in this code that I'm fairly confident in is uh, pushing SSH keys um, to nodes as well. Doesn't cause a reboot now. Um, so, and we're looking at we're looking at ways to, uh, you know, either you know expand this list, perhaps allow administrators to 
um, expand it on their own. But it's a it's a difficult question and one that we have to um, be very careful with. Uh, we don't want to put users into a position where uh, where they're going to shoot themselves in the foot too easily. Uh, but at the same time, um, they do own their own cluster. So we want to empower admins. And it's uh, always finding that balance can be tricky. But there you go. There's the SSH yeah. keys. It seems that there's specific handling for SSH keys. I haven't actually dug into that. That's interesting. I think it's also because, yeah, I mean, well, I, perhaps because also, you know, whether it's added or removed, um, any change will, yeah. should, should, uh, should not cause. And uh, the pull secret too, the, for those familiar with the pull secret on your OpenShift cluster, that is another one that doesn't, doesn't cause a reboot nowadays. Well, that, that's a good one. Cause uh, when I, whenever I, go in and uh, uh, add or change my pull secret so that I can access the internal versions right, the, 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 of the builds and it has to go through and reboot all the nodes. <laughs> so the, that's, the, that's a handy one. The one I think for the outside world that is the best uh, or is the, is the most useful is, the, uh, is that, that certificate swap, right? It's the, it's the CA certificate that signs the API to Kubelet communication. Mm -hmm. And uh, that has a one year lifespan. And prior to 4.7.4, .4, when that, when, when 80%, I believe, of that, of that one year would come up about day 292, you would just out of nowhere roll the, cl the cluster rolls. And then at day 365, so it would add the new certificate. We mm -hmm. add the new certificate early so that you're not in danger. So there's a, some overlap. But then day 365, it would come back and reap the old certificate, and that would be another reboot. And the thing that was, I think, most problematic about it, and customers had the most issue with, it was they didn't know it was coming. I mean, it's one thing if you if you actually set a machine config and, you know, I pressed the button and then the cluster rolled. And it's another thing where people are like, why are the servers rebooting? And so this was, uh, so we fixed that. Yeah. I, and I seem to recall that... Uh bare metal deployments were also a contributor there because we, we forget how long it takes to reboot hardware sometimes. <laughs> I, I think some of the, you know, some of the early adopters and for people who are running in very, very cloud centric, you know, very, very purely cloud native, they don't sweat it with the nodes, even rolling the cluster isn't that big a deal to them necessarily. But when you have set clusters and like you said, it could be a 12 minute post for, for these servers nowadays, um, that reboot can be very costly. Yeah. Yeah, got to check all that RAM, and when you've got multiple terabytes of RAM, mm. yeah. so we are we are looking at uh, we're looking like I said for different ways to to knock it down. Um, if 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 folks on the stream uh, want to send in their suggestions for particular actions they feel like do not require a reboot that they are hitting regularly, that it would ease their pain if that was changed, um, I'd be uh, all ears. Yeah, and you are. It Absolutely welcome anytime to reach out to me, uh, andrew.sullivan at redhat.com. Uh, or if you're on the chat, you can reach me on social media, Twitter at Practical Andrew, just like the, uh, 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 my username in the chat there. 640K of RAM should be enough for anybody. You're right, Christian. Absolutely uh, correct. Yeah. Couldn't be more wrong ever. But yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So uh, I, I know we've uh, we've got a little over 30 minutes now, 35 minutes. Do we have a hard stop today, Chris? We do. OK, uh, so security is a I'm going to put it mildly and say it's a big topic, <laughs> right? <laughs> there is it's a huge topic. <laughs> yeah. It, you know, just looking at, at Red Hat and kind of things that relate to OpenShift and containers and cloud native and all of that, right? The, the topic we can span anywhere from like the secure software supply chain and kind of developer practices and principles all the way down to like low level operating system things, uh, which is, you know, we're administrators here. So that's kind of the side that we're going to favor uh, when we talk about these things. But my point is you could fill multiple libraries with the books that have been written on this topic. So it's unfeasible for us to address you know, kind of more than just a scratch across the, the surface when it comes to that. And I really want to highlight a couple of, of things. Um, so one is the security ebook, and I'll post a link into that. Uh, so this is a, a, another step in that direction of how do I go and get started and learn more and learn about this broad ecosystem of things. Also highlights Red Hat Summit every year has multiple sessions on the security topic. 
Uh, so you can always go there and find more information. Um, and Red Hat Summit the last two years has been free registration, right? You can just go to the website. Uh, and the other one, and this one I haven't actually looked at yet because they just announced it like 15 minutes before we before we started on stream. Uh, but we just released a uh, another. Oh, yeah. 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 So it's it's this an open approach to vulnerability management. Uh, mm -hmm. So it, and it really describes how Red Hat works and how Red Hat addresses these vulnerabilities uh, across the product lines. So. Uh, I, while I haven't read it, I can only assume that it's going to be a good read and it's going to be an interesting one. Um, so I, I'm looking forward to it this afternoon after after the stream. Oh wow, you you have time to read during the day. That's lucky. Um, it's in between chats and emails, so <sighs> yeah, it's oh. the, the advantage of multiple monitors. Yeah, 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 good point. Yeah, I should take advantage <laughs> of that at some point. So it's a 23 page doc, though it should be a light read for everybody. Yeah, and, and I also want to highlight that you know OpenShift and, and CoreOS is only one component in that. Um, when we look at the bigger Red Hat portfolio, you know, of course you have things that are directly related to OpenShift, uh, ACS, ACM, uh, Quay, uh, UBI, right? All of those play a role as well. Um, not just, you know, at RHEL, of course, because RHEL is the foundation for both CoreOS as well as UBI. Yeah. Um, but more broadly, things like Satellite and Ansible and using those tools to help manage and implement your security posture. Uh, but today, and the reason why we have these three fine folks joining us uh, is to talk about a couple of specific features or specific things inside of OpenShift. And I want to start with something that we have talked about. We've kind of flirted with it a little bit before, and that is the compliance operator. Hmm. So I think, and Doran, I, I, if you don't mind, I think I'm going to start with you. And I, I want to ask kind of two questions here. So one what is compliance and what does the compliance operator do for that? Okay, so compliance is the way for, our, for us, for administrators and, and people that managing IT infrastructure uh, to comply for a specific framework. Okay, it's the way that I know that I can run workloads that are aligned with my industry. If I'm in the industry of, of bank banking, I want to know that my, my cluster are PCI DSS, but I can transit a credit card numbers. If I'm in the, in the industry of medical, I want to know that my cluster is HIPAA compliant. It said that the, the industry is setting up a standard for compliance or what, what controls I want to apply to my, my infrastructure. And based on this compliance, I know that my, my, infrastructure, my infrastructure is ready to run this workload. So um, I want to separate between the technical compliance and the physical compliance or more process compliance. Uh, technical compliance are things that we can uh, accomplish by setting things in the system, like blocking IP addresses or blocking ports or allow, not allow specific users to access the uh, resource. But there are tons of resources, tons of controls that are physical resource or user resource, like who are allowed to log into the system, who are allowed to go to this to the data center, all kind of things that are we cannot control or we cannot uh, uh, we cannot control by uh, uh, by technical controls. So compliance operator is focused on on technical controls. We are enforcing and uh, we, we scan for controls. We're looking for, for things are, that are part of the standards. Uh, we were, currently we have the CIS uh, benchmark standard. We have the, uh, we are working on FedRAMP and uh, PCI DSS. And we have additional compli uh, compliance framework what we already developed. And uh, we allow to run scans and scan the, uh, the cluster for this compliance and see if the cluster is compliant comply with, uh, with this standard or not. We also uh, allow to do, we also do remediation. So if we find things in the cluster that are not uh, up to the standard, we, the compliance operator uh, can, uh, can update the cluster, run scripts to fix things that we can, we can fix. Of course, some of the, some of the fixes can be destructive, so we need to be very careful about it. 
and we're working on our team and was in, in, in lead there is working very hard to make the compliance and be, add more and more controls and, and more compliance libraries to, to our to the compliance operator. So do you have anything you want to add anything? I mean I think uh, you summarized it quite well. I mean the thing that we got to think about is that compliance standards are there for a reason, right? Normally you want to protect certain data. PCI DSS, you got to make sure that our credit card information is secure right, HIPAA medical records, right, or uh, NERC-SIP uh, that the important assets of a power plant are secure, right? So with all of that in mind, it, like you can imagine that there's a big, big, big list of requirements of you should do this and they can be quite vague. So a big part of our jobs is trying to translate that into, hey, well, if I wanna secure this uh, or if I wanna isolate our credit card data and the workloads that hold credit card data, we should be using uh, tens of tolerations in OpenShift and use a network policy, right? So the translation from a, what would look like a vague or random requirement towards a specific control or a specific setting in OpenShift is basically what the compliance operator is doing and what my team does. And I, I think you're headed towards OpenSCAP as that, that definition of what each of those compliance standards looks like. Exactly. And, okay. And then is that translated into OpenShift and Kubernetes actions by the compliance operator, or is there something else there? Like, it, it, and, and forgive me, I'm unfamiliar with OpenSCAP aside from it's kind of a repository, but it's one of those, like, I understand that maybe I have, I, I need to have HIPAA compliance. So I'm going to deploy the file or uh, the uh, compliance operator, and I'm going to apply the HIPAA standard. How do I know what that translates to from a requirements actions type of, of uh, standpoint? Sure, and that's an excellent question. And don't worry about not being acquainted with OpenSCAP. There's like five people in the world that know that stuff. Like, <laughs> come on. So no, uh, so one thing that I wanna put forward beforehand is that um, we didn't wanna reinvent the wheel, right? I know that there's a lot of people that made us a lot of questions like why OpenSCAP? And, the main thing is that it's already a, an accepted standard. Well, SCAP is a standard, OpenSCAP is just an implementation of it. And uh, we just basically try to make a community flourish, right, by adding yet another product that they check. So in really in compliance as code, which actually compiles to SCAP, um, they check stuff for RHEL, SUSE, Arcos nowadays, OpenShift, OpenStack, uh, they have some Apple checks even. So th there's a lot of stuff in there. And basically what they do is that they try to come up with a way to translate uh, security requirements into stuff that's automatable. So we're going to have data such as uh, this, we're checking for this specific setting in the cluster. We're checking this because this might be uh, a way that an attacker might get to you. So write the description and the rationale we also get, have information about how to manually check for something, which is gonna be something used by an auditor or maybe you wanna check by yourself, like uh, OC get bots and give me the ones that are privileged, right? Something like that. Mm -hmm. So we have all this information and we also have automated checks, right? So there is this standard called Oval, uh, which is part of SCAP, which allows you to do this kind of thing. Um, and without going too deep into details as well, we also have references. So a profile is gonna be a collection of rules and those rules are all of the information that I put before, right? So you're gonna run, um, I wanna be compliant with the moderate profile. Okay, that's gonna run a lot of rules. Uh, are you enabling this audit rules in your host? Are you enabling etcd encryption? Uh, do all of your uh, namespaces have appropriate network policies? And it's gonna give you uh, a report and that report will contain the uh, reference from NIST that, that you're completing with that, mm -hmm. right? So eventually you can bring that to your auditor. They're gonna be checking, oh, so you need to meet uh, uh, SI7. All right, cool. So here's in the report and so on, right? So you're cross-referencing uh, what comes from NIST and what comes from the compliance operator. And it's not only NIST, right? We have references for PCI DSS. We have references for NERC-SIP uh, and is coming. So, 
I don't know if I answered the question, but uh, but we don't check for a specific control from a standard. We check for a rule, mm -hmm. and that rule happens to reference a control from a standard. Got it. Yeah. So I, I'm I'm most familiar with like the CIS benchmarks and their right. set of rules and what that looks like and the automation in order to check and also apply those. Um, so I, to me, in my head, I map this over to this is just a standardized way of defining those rules, associating them into um, what I'm going to call an inventory of rules that make up a compliance baseline, and then how to you know check and then ultimately remediate against those. Yeah. Is that accurate? Yeah. Right, exactly. And one thing back to the remediations that you asked about. Um, normally in OpenSCAP, we there is a thing called a fix. And the fix can take many ways. You have several systems to apply a fix, right? So SCAP actually supports Ansible. So you could generate playbooks out of that. Uh, SCAP supports bash scripts. And there was another one that I forgot, Anaconda, I think. You can form your Anaconda definition mm -hmm. there. Uh, in our case, we introduced something that we call just a Kubernetes fix. So we only deal with Kubernetes objects, right? We try to play nice with the cluster in OpenShift 4. Everything is a CRD, everything is a resource. And so we, we make sure to play nice with that. So what's going to happen is that we, we, if we detect a failure, we get the fix for that failure that turns into a Kubernetes object and the compliance operator will either report that so you can apply that yourself or it can apply it itself. Depends on what you want, right? We, we give you that flexibility. Yeah. So we're not going to be makes changing... Sense. Right, we're not going to be changing stuff under you. Like we're going to be using machine configs. We're going to be using uh, patches towards you know the API cluster object and so on. And just to be clear, all of this, the compliance operator is one component that works in conjunction with ACS, Advanced Cluster Security. That works in conjunction with ACM. Um, I see Christian in the chat. Right, that ultimately can work with things like GitOps. Um, mm -hmm. I'd be curious to know your, your thoughts around, you know, is there a preferred way of, do I deploy the compliance operator? I tell it to, you know, uh, uh, check for and then remediate against this standards. Is it worthwhile to just let it control that configuration or should I take that applied configuration and then manage it using something like GitOps? We try to be flexible and just give folks the, the power to do whatever they want. Uh, honestly, uh, I've been experimenting with GitOps quite a bit recently. And so the compliance operator and the SCAP, uh, you know, data stream, which is the collection of all the rules and everything, um, it, it is a big repository of fixes or best practices for, for a certain standard. So there is no reason why you can't use it with Argo CD or with, uh, with Hive and stuff like mm -hmm. that. So. We do have work ongoing about bringing that together. So you would be able to do one command like OC compliance fetch fixes for Argo CD and it'll just download it. You can put it in Git and then handle your multiple clusters with it, Got right? It. So, so it, it will be possible and you don't exactly need the operator to do that, but you are gonna need the operator to keep generating scans and the operator is actually able to leverage all of that information and tell you, hey, you're compliant. Or if you go out of compliance, it'll just give you a fix for that. Yeah, you, you just said what I was getting ready to say, which is you would still want to use the operator for, if nothing else, auditing and, and yeah. having that uh, set of logs. So I'm going to change directions a little bit. And I'm going to move towards the file integrity operator. Uh, and this is one that is really interesting to me. And, and Mark and I have had conversations about this before because in the early marketing materials that we had for CoreOS, we talked a lot about how it's an immutable operating system. And, you know, so having this, you know, operator whose role is basically to check for and tell you if something changes, like how does that mesh with, how does that you know, resolve against this immutable operating system. So I, I don't mean to put you on the spot, Mark, but I'm going to, I'm going to put you on the spot. <laughs> sure. It's my, one of my favorite topics. So it, it, we do, we do sometimes call it controlled immutability. Um, and if you check the actual documentation, the definition of what we have is that, you know, we, we distribute and install a read only slash user. So all the OS binaries, 
in that sense, everybody at, at whatever rev of the cluster you're at, you are running a specific version of RHEL Core OS that's been tested with that version. You're running the same version of that slash user as everybody else running the same version of that cluster. Um, Etsy and VAR, uh, for di different reasons, are, are read-write. Um, VAR obviously needs to, to have some state, needs to have a place to cache containers. Etsy is there though as read-write for configuration purposes, though you're only, um, the idea is that you should only be changing it through machine configs and not manually. And so where the confusion comes in, and I think where you're getting out with the question is, there is sometimes an assumption that the MCO, the machine config operator, will tell you any, anytime anything has changed. And that, 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 that's what it does. And, and it does not, it implements the config. And if you, and it looks after the files that it controls. Mm -hmm. So if it has pushed a file, and that could be ones that you choose to push, and that could be ones that are built into machine configs in the system. If you look, by the way, if you'd like to look, um, I mean, we could bring this up, but it's, it's gonna be a little ugly. If you look at the rendered, every pool has a rendered config. And what a rendered config is, is basically just snippeting all, taking all the snippets of configuration together and putting them into a single configuration. And you can see the files that it, that it manages. Um, please don't ever delete these. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> if you do delete them, please call Red Hat support immediately after. Right. <laughs> Yeah. Um, mm. So it pushes these, and 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 it's a, you know it's base sixty four encoded most of the contents, um, in some cases. So these if these files are changed, um, the MCO will notice them the next time you go to push out an update. It does not currently, today, we are, we're looking at changing this. It does not check on a regular basis. It's when you push out a new configuration or when you push out an update. It checks to see, hey, before I chain, make this change, it, does the node look the way I, it, I'm expecting it to look? Yeah. And if not, maybe we should stop here and tell the admin, you know, dear human being, you might want to look at this. Um, yeah. And, and just to reinforce that, I've seen two instances of that happen just recently. Um, one was a uh, customer who had modified the, uh, the SSH keys, right? They just I think they had debugged in and added a different SSH key. And of course, when... MCO went to remediate. It said, I don't know what this is and caused to, to, uh, to halt. The other we one are looking to make that on that particular note, we are looking to make that check more regular so mm -hmm. that um, in the case somebody has done, a, you know, you do a test modification, you forget about it, and then it's going to rear its ugly head later when you're going to update during your maintenance window. So we don't want yeah. that. We want you to know as soon as possible that there's something uh, unexpected in the on-disk state. And this is where I think the question will segue over is that if you do want to look at, you know, you want to know, I want to know anything that changes under Etsy uh, or, you know, and I want to watch these files specifically. I think that's where, where uh, we, we have that, but that's where the file integrity operator comes in. Yeah. And, and so that's really the big difference, right? Is machine config operator and the machine configs, it only cares about the files that it's been told to care about. Um, so, you know, yeah, we've got this massive file here, um, you know, with lots of things. <laughs> so in it. it could be a little bit tricky to, to figure that out, but yes, um, it, it, it's not going to be, I think the takeaway though, is that it's not looking for any change under Etsy. If the machine, yeah. if the MCO is not managing that file, it's also not going to care that you have created, you know, Etsy, mycoolconf.conf. Yeah. It's just not going to notice. So whereas the file integrity operator, and, and now I'm getting out over my skis a little bit. So the file integrity operator, essentially, when it's enabled, it goes and creates a database of, I'm, I'm going to say hashes, I'm guessing hashes of what those files look like. And then it periodically rechecks those. And I don't know what that interval interval is. And basically checks to see if it has changed at all. And if it has, you know, hey, this, this changed. Did you know this changed um, type type of thing? Uh, one question. Diagram. I have a diagram of how the file integrity is working and can explain the process. So, so one, one question I do have for you, Mark, while, while Doran is bringing that up is the way that CoreOS does updates, 
right, is RPM OS tree. So we know that var and Etsy are mutable, right? They can be changed. When we do those RPM OS tree updates, when, when we switch to that new tree, will it replace, will it reset any of those files under those two file systems? Uh, no, it does not. It, okay. It, it just, it just does. If you, um, yeah, it's, it's, it, it, we distribute the, what we call the machine OS content. And that is, that is slash user. Okay, so essentially an update will only affect, um, through RPM OS tree, will only affect user. Um, all the rest of it is more or less left to its, its own devices from an update perspective. You know, I'm trying to think if, you know, within a, yes, it should be. I mean, in theory, there could be a rel package that updates their configuration file midstream in theory. I don't think that happens a lot though, especially within a rel major, right? Like within a rel eight, which is where we take our content for our costs. Mm -hmm. um, but anyway, so no, yes, I mean, it, it, is there a theoretical uh, change there? But no, I don't. In reality, um, it's just going to be slash user and Etsy is going to stay maintained the way you had it uh, based on the MCO and the rendered config for that pool. Got it. So yeah, I'm, I'm learning new things all the time. See, this is, this is the problem with Andrew no longer being like a, a full-time, like my, my paid job is to be an administrator is most of the clusters I create, they might live a week. <laughs> yeah. So, and, and of course they're all lab clusters, they're all test clusters. So I generally don't go through the process of deploying and testing and, and seeing all of these things in action. Um, and Mar Mark and Doran, I know, you know, like, uh, and we, I briefly mentioned this on one of the other streams of you all, the PM team has a cluster that you use and that you maintain like long-term running. So that way, you know, we can do, well, you all, uh, mostly get that hands-on experience, um, with the product, with all of the features, with everything else, which I think is really cool. That's what I was going to say. And, and what's, what's better or worse. With, with every option installed together. <laughs> mm. This is yeah. uh, the top, top trim version of, of OpenShift. So yeah, it's uh, oh, oh, never a dull day, right? When it's your, when it's your, was it two week rotations for who's responsible for the cluster? Yeah. Um, so, so Mark, if you don't mind, I want to talk a little bit more about some, some core OS things. Um, so one, as you mentioned, it's built on top of RHEL. Uh, we've mentioned that a bunch of times because we inherit things like drivers, hardware compatibility, um, a lot of the other security features from RHEL itself. And that includes things like SE Linux. Um, and, and I know SE Linux was, uh, we recently brought it up because of the NSA hardening guide. Uh, so they had published that hardening guide and I think we've got a link somewhere. Yeah, uh, I, I, I had a link somewhere. Um, and I kind of, I think most of us looked at it and said, oh, well, most of those are already applied if you're using CoreOS and OpenShift, right? Either through SE Linux or through other mechanisms that we have. So I thought that was really interesting. I don't know if you have any other comments around SE Linux being used with Kubernetes and OpenShift or not. I just feel like uh, just, just to back up, you know, how well it works, um, you know, how we build off of RHEL and how important that is. So, you know, I'm not necessarily, I'm far from, um, the deepest, even at the PM level, uh, uh, SE Linux expert. But what I do know is that, you know, all the core services that we get in RHEL Core OS come over from RHEL. And we have years of experience in isolating those services from each other, isolating them from user workloads. Um, and so we protect them from rogue activities on the system. We protect them such that if one is compromised, that that compromise doesn't lead to further compromises on the system. Um, in the case of OpenShift, really, I'd say that the layer on top of that is that we have also now years of experience managing, you know, and extending the isolation between containers um, beyond what container isolation right out of the Linux kernel um, gives you. And, you know, so we have policies that separate all the platform containers, SDN, et cetera, um, that, um, you know, again, protects protects customers and their core systems from from flaws in one component or another. Um, 
I'm trying to think there's something else I, I sort of wanted to throw in there. Um, it'll come back to me. Um, <laughs> I have that problem all the time. <laughs> but in, in, I, I, I think this was it. Um, we've, We've never had, uh, to my knowledge, uh, and you know, feel free to uh, anyone to jump in, but we've never had like a run C or container escape that wasn't already at least mitigated, if not prevented out of the box by our policies. Um, that could be the, the read-only user, which, which, can, which can help in some instances, but typically it's, it's, it's SE Linux that stops these, um, that stops these CVEs from being very exploitable on the platform. Sorry for yeah. the sales pitch, but it's true. Well, no, I, I was, you know, when we were doing the notes and prepping for this, uh, I, I brought up one and I'm like, oh, I remember there was one that we just talked about this and I, I found it, uh, which was there, there's an RHSB and a, an appropriate CVE, which I just posted in the chat around. It, it was the one that we talked about here on the stream, actually. Um, long path name and mount point flaws in the kernel. And like, if you scroll down in this thing and here, I'll... I'll uh, let me copy it over to the right browser and then I'll share my screen real quick here. So if, if you scroll down in this particular security bulletin and look at the mitigation, like the mitigation is basically you're using rel congrats. <laughs> like, like, wait, you've mitigated it. <laughs> so um, I, I thought that was kind of a, a great example of, you know, the, the underlying platform does matter, right? It's which Linux you use does matter. Um, and yeah, to your point, I know it's a bit of a sales pitch, but um, it, it's important. Actually, I just I want to throw in though, like long path, like <laughs> exceeds one gigabyte. Long path is not even, doesn't even describe it if your path <laughs> is a gigabyte. Yeah. I mean, I'm, that's really impressive. Um, let's see, where did I get lost at here? So, okay. Um, the other thing I wanted to ask you about is FIPS. Um, so I, I think FIPS compliance was added to CoreOS back in like the four, three days. Oh, yeah. Four, two or four, three. Yeah, four, yeah. So it was pretty early on. Um, and, and so my understanding of FIPS is it is a, it's a U.S. government thing around encryption and specifically there's a bunch of different levels that I've never quite understood myself. Um, and that all plays a role in like FIPS 140-2, you know, or, or, or level one, level two, level three, so on and so forth. So can you elaborate or, or help educate me on FIPS mode and OpenShift and what that means? Uh, sure. I mean, I, I know it more from the real chorus point of view. So if anybody else wants to add on, I will not be hurt. Um, what we have is you have the FIPS validated modules and the modules in process. Um, so we, you know, we only, we, we ship one or the other, um, depending on where, you know, where it is in the cycle. Um, what that means is that, yeah, you're using, you're using FIPS validated kernel crypto modules, um, open SSL, um, and, uh, and when you are using a UBI container. So not only does that mean that the services will be on the, on the nodes will be running in FIPS mode, meaning they're only going to be using those ciphers uh, from those particular like set ciphers from those modules. It also means that if you're running UBI containers on those on top of on OpenShift, they will be um, automatically using the correct uh, ciphers as well. I think, I don't know if, if uh, Oz, if you want to add anything to that but it seems like I wasn't too far off. No, that was about right. And that's the main challenge usually with FIPS in general, that uh, if you run a funky container with some funky base, uh, it will not inherit FIPS because it has no way of knowing that, right? As opposed to using a rail-based container like UBI or anything like that, that it actually detects that you have FIPS enforcing, it configures the crypto policy in the container itself and makes sure that you have everything right. And ready to go. And you don't need right, and then you don't have to worry about it at the the app or container level. What I do want to point out, and I don't uh, I don't quiz me on the difference. I don't know, but we are I think already to getting to the point where it's one forty dash three, not one forty dash two. Um, and I think maybe this is not super well known outside of uh, the bubble, but you can't submit versions. So when people are waiting for, for full FIPS validation, it takes a while because we are at the mercy of NIST 
Um, and not only that, we can't submit until it's, it's GA. We, we, can't, we can't give them a beta early so that we can come roaring at the gates with, you know, rel 8, 8x is if it's validated. We have to release it and then submit it. Strange question for you. Has that process been slowed down at all by like co coronavirus and all of that? It, it was. And I think there was some split attention. I don't know if anybody else can add to that. There was some split attention, both uh, coronavirus, but also uh, the development of 140-3 was happening simultaneously. And, and also, uh, we are not submitting the full platform. We're submitting only the, the, the core OS version. So because, you know, you can... You cannot fix compliance for the whole platform a little bit problematic. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, basic, it's basically for customers that want to use in Fedron, to, to use the OpenShift in Fedron phone or other federal uh, compliance level. But it's the basic building blocks for, for Fedron. So I, I'm, I'm going to ask a quick question, and I'm not sure who will be able to answer it. So I'm not going to deliberately throw anyone under the bus. So I know a lot of times as administrators, one of the frustrating things that we first encounter when first using OpenShift is no root user in containers. Yeah. So I, I know it's kind of, it's related to a number of different things, SCCs, SC Linux, and all that other stuff. So I, I'm curious if anybody has kind of a, a terse, right, a, a 30 second version of the perspective on that. Because I think a lot of people, you know, might think, oh, SE Linux, right? It should protect me. Why, why does it matter what user ID I'm using if, if SE Linux is in place and all these other things? Well, all right. Okay. By, well, by, bystander case. effect. So <laughs> I, I will, um, so no, I'm, I'm not going to force anybody to, to put anything out there. So I, I'll, I'll poke some people and see if we can get an answer to that. I'll include it in the blog post. Um, You're talking to infrastructure people sometimes, and sometimes it's like, wait, whoa, 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 apps? <laughs> I know, right? I, I have that issue. Inside too. the container? <laughs> so, uh, well, my dog well, is growling, which means that it's probably time to go. Um, just to answer real quick, because I was hoping that somebody else would answer, in case there's a container escape, uh, your user ID is going to prevent you from accessing anything from the host. Uh, Selenix is going to help. But there are things that your container is still going to have access to, even if you're using SC Linux, right? So having a non-root user is going to prevent you from, or prevent a container from accessing anything else. So it's just like an in-depth approach to security where, hey, in case you bypass Linux, you still can bypass the, the next layer, which is your standard Unix user ID. Yeah, it, it makes sense, even if it is a bit frustrating as a, a first-time OpenShift user when you can't just go, you know, use this Docker image that comes from somewhere, anywhere, or and or even my own ones, right? I have to go in and set that UID correctly um, in order to get it to work. So it, it's one of those, like, it is a valid thing, even if it can be a little bit frustrating, maybe even a little confusing um, at first. So it is uh, almost the top of the hour, which means that uh, we do have a hard stop today. So we need to, uh, we need to close out the stream. So first and foremost, thank you very much to our guests today. Uh, so Mark, Oz, Doran, really, really appreciate you coming on. Really appreciate the time that you gave us today. Um, can't thank you enough, uh, Oz, especially. I know you came in very last minute. So thank you so much for that. Uh, to our audience, thank you very much for your attention today. We really appreciate the interactivity. I've seen the chat scrolling by. Y'all have been great. Um, so I will take all of this information. I will put links to specific spots in the video. Keep an eye on the blog post. Uh, so that's cloud.redhat.com slash blog now. Uh, so I will have that blog post published hopefully Friday, if not maybe early next week. And with all of that being said, I hope everybody has a great day, a great week, and I'm going to steal Chris's line, which is stay safe out there. Awesome. Thank you. Take care.